Well, good evening, good evening. Good to see you here tonight. Glad to be with you. We had an interesting morning, to say the least, and I think that you would all agree that uh, we had an interesting morning. Whenever I first started talking with the elders about Steve coming to visit, and up till the time he came, I've been saying Steve is a retired Navy man and an old merchant marine, and he'll say nearly anything. But he said things today that surprised me, and uh, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple of things that uh, you need to know if there's a question. We've, we've not discussed his visit uh, prior, much other than just saying what he did. But um, we, we have never supported Steve in that work, that part of Nigeria. The man that we do supports in Nigeria, but it's further to the north and to the east of where Joss is. And um, so we're, we were investigating this as a potential for expanding our world missions. Uh, we are knowing that we have not had much mission work going outside this country and uh, not in this country either and that it's a shortfall, a shortcoming on our part. And so we're looking into the possibility, hoping that at least by the new budget time that we may be able to add this work. If you feel that it's something you think you'd like to underwrite and help and support, you might mention to the elders about how you feel about that if you were impressed. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just trying to have you aware of what's going on, why he was here. And the elders will be meeting with him further tomorrow morning to get to specifics about what might be needed and that sort of thing before uh, they'll be leaving town tomorrow afternoon, or early, I guess about noon, and uh, going down to Tulsa and visit with uh, one of the preachers uh, at Broken Arrow. He, when he was with the Chisholm Hills Church where he was when I first met him, uh, there was a gentleman preaching there named Tim Piles. Tim has subsequently gone to Dallas and another place or two and then settled in Broken Arrow. And so he's going down to spend a night with them. They were together on staff there at Chisholm Hills before the time that I came. I followed Tim in that work. So good that he'd be able to make that visit too. I, uh, I knew that I'd be hearing some things about what uh, went on this morning. Uh, and uh, I, I, there's some areas I'm not going to go tonight. I'm not going to talk about the uh, color of any woman's hair, uh, except that one woman in, uh, who's in Alabama with the white hair, and uh, she's been telling me pretty regularly, tell everybody I said hello. Tell everybody I said hello. Well, I can't do that. And, you know, I can tell you guys who are here tonight, but everybody's not here. And I don't, can't take the personal time to do that all the time. But she does want to be remembered to you. And the most popular question that I've been being asked about Betty is, when is she coming home? And uh, that's scheduled to be Wednesday night after services. I'm supposed to pick her up out at the airport. So we're looking forward to her being with us again. Today, she and Monty, Daniel's mom went over to Selmer, Tennessee, where he's working part-time as youth minister to worship with him and his bride there. And I don't have a report yet on how that went, but I'm sure that it went well. And uh, we uh, want to send that greeting to you and explain those things uh, uh, in the... I got a sermon that uh, I've been wanting to preach and Suddenly today I realized that I better preach it tonight. Uh, and sure enough, uh, Roger came in and asked me if I'd heard about the deacons meeting this afternoon. And I hadn't known about one. I didn't think I'd missed anything on the calendar. And yet I knew they'd meet any time they want to. I was a bit curious and he said, well, what the main thing that came out of that meeting was that we decided that by next Sunday we can have the red light installed uh, for the sermons. And so if I'm going to preach a long sermon, i got to preach it tonight, right? <laughs> the topic is a bit unusual. I, I picked it up from 
the book of Jeremiah in chapter two in verse 36, is a time when in the King James Version and the New King James Version, there is the question that God asked of his people, why do you gad about so much? Now, we don't use that phrase a whole lot. When we do, usually it is about someone who's just kind of uh, lost their, their route, they're, they're, they're uh, aimlessly going this way or that without direction, seemingly without purpose. And uh, you've heard me say before, I often speak of those people as being sleepwalkers. They're just kind of ambling through life without any particular aim and goal. And uh, they, uh, they, they befuddle you if you're trying to accomplish things and get places, but you, uh, you have to realize that's their lifestyle. Well, the way that the Lord used it in that phrase is not just about people who are aimless and without direction. But these are uh, people who are, uh, in the newer translations, it just says going about. The people of God had deserted him and they were behaving in ways that uh, seemed highly inappropriate. And uh, I'm gonna invite you to read that whole chapter in some areas that I'm just not gonna to try to go into all the expounding of what he's describing, but you'll be able to pick it up and you'll see that he's, he's talking about the fact that you, my people, you, you've been just kind of running around and flaunting yourself in front of other people in unbecoming ways, and you'll go off with anybody and you'll You'll sidle up to anybody and you'll do anything with anybody. And he's seeing that they are gadding about. That's the way that he's using that. If you read the, the whole of the text, you find that uh, God says uh, that I, I need you to understand that you're just not like you need to be. You're not faithful, you're not dependable. You're, you're, you have your heart on other things and you turned away from me. No wonder he would say and ask the question, why, why do my people get about so? As he starts the chapter, he's reminding them that there was a time when they were, as it were, young as a nation, when, the, when he'd just chosen Abraham's seed and, and he's starting to lead them and promise them all the things he was going to do for them. He was saying, I took you when you were young and I, I blessed you and I took you to Egypt and I protected you and I brought you out of Egypt and I gave you the land. All these things, and yet he says, you, you didn't seem to appreciate it and you violated the relationship that we had. In this uh, context of that chapter, it's pretty easy to see that God is alluding to the relationship that he envisioned that he had with Israel as being like a marriage. You are supposed to be committed to me as I am committed to you. You're supposed to be keeping vows of faithfulness and obedience as was the early arrangement. I, I established, God said, the, the way that things were supposed to be. And yet he said, you've gone astray. He said, you've linked yourself with Assyria. You've linked yourself with Egypt. And besides that, he said, you have, uh, you've gone after other gods. And then he posed the question and I've, I preached on this part of it before, whenever God says, I just, and I'll paraphrase a bit, he said, you, you check the, the nations, you check history, you look around about, and you, you just see if there's any nation that's ever changed its gods. And yet he said, you have left me and you've gone after idols. You have left the, the only one who really could support and, and give you everything you need. You've left that and you've gone to these idols who can give you nothing. They're just sticks that have been carved into certain forms. For instance, they have no power or anything. You have left your God, he, he calls it, you have left your glory. You left a glorious God Almighty. 
to follow after gods who are no gods. When you need something, they can't do a thing. And you're on your own. I've blessed and I've blessed, but he said, you are going to suffer. You're going to be punished and your children and your children's children are going to be punished because of this situation. You can't just change gods like some people change baits. You, you, you can't do that. He's saying, I'm, I'm calling for commitment. I'm calling for people who will do what's supposed to be done, who will keep that commitment and be faithful to it all the way through as a people. Before that can happen, of course, it has to occur in individuals. Individuals have to be committed and then, of course, a nation can be, but not without it starting at the grassroots. And he's addressing that also with them. But he said, what did I do that offended your fathers? What did I do that disappointed your forefathers when I blessed all of these things? And he said, whenever trouble came, your fathers didn't say, where's God? They didn't turn to me. They didn't look for me. They didn't search. They didn't seek help. They didn't say, where is God? And then he said, furthermore, your prophets didn't say, where is God? And your priests didn't say, where is God? And your shepherds didn't say, where is God? And the people who were supposed to be pointing you toward God didn't say, where is God? Nobody pointed toward God. And you just started to gad about, flauntering here and there, and chasing this idea and that, this God, and that God. And he said, I can't tell exactly whether God's saying, maybe I'm a little at fault. I don't really think that that would be true. And therefore, he wouldn't be saying that. But yet, he said to them in, uh, in verse 20, he said, years ago, I threw off your, your, I broke your yoke and I threw off your bonds. He said, I, I, I really gave you liberty. I trusted you. I put you on your own, so to speak. I gave you the law. I gave you what you're supposed to do. And then I made you responsible for your own behavior. I, I did not just clamp down on you. I didn't take away your free moral agency. I left you with the freedom of choice. And I think he's saying, did I do wrong to have given you that? Because you used that liberty to go chasing after everything and refused to keep my commandments. That's why he said, I'm going to punish. I will not allow this to continue indefinitely because you're just wasting yourselves. You're wasting your opportunity. You're turning to these, these false gods, non-gods that can help you. And then he describes in, in great detail, and this, this is where I think it's sensitive uh, to say, but he alludes to the people of God who are doing this gadding about as being like a young female donkey who is in season or camel that's in season and who will just run to any male of the species and be involved in reproduction. That's what he said, You're, my people are just like that. You're going around snorting and, and just flaunting yourselves and engaging in it'd be spiritual fornication. And he said, I, I can't tolerate that. I can't stand that. That's, that's the gadding about that he's talking about. It's, it's not like, you know, tonight we could say, well, where, where are some of our people? And some folks might say, well, maybe they're just gadding about. No, no, no. They're, they're not doing this. They're in other places or young people or several of them in a Midwest teens meeting, I believe, and some 
of our members have helped take them there so they can be there. Jed and other ones of our young people have gone to another camp and that's where they are. They're not gadding about. We don't know where everybody is, but we know in, in reason. We don't have people doing this kind of gadding about. They're not leaving God. They're, they're not being uh, inappropriate. They, they're not here. And we would love to have them here, but, but we're not accusing and, and, and this isn't the same thing. That's why I wanted this morning, surely to say that I didn't want anybody to be saying, well, it's talking about those of us who aren't there because he's talking about gadding about. No, I'm talking about the purity of life. When we cross over to the Christian age, it's interesting that probably the thing that stands out the most uh, vividly in this is on God's part is that he expresses the fact that he'd offered a grace to these people that's greater than what we usually talk about when we're talking about Old Testament religion. He said, I, I, I broke your bonds and, and I took off you know, your restraints years ago. I, he, by his providence, he set into motion a whole process by which they could be free from their sins. We say, well, they, they, they died before Jesus was born. They died before his blood was shed. They, they died before they could be forgiven. But that is short-sighted and failing to realize that God did set that into process a long, long time ago. And what happened was that when Jesus died on the cross, and this is a familiar saying, but I'm trying to make the application, that when Jesus died on the cross, the, the blood of Jesus flowed backward to cover the sins of all the righteous during this time. All these people whom, whom he's saying, I broke your bonds and, and I threw off your restraints. He said, I made salvation possible for you in my plans years and years ago. When Ephesians chapter three talks about the church, it speaks to the fact that this was the eternal purpose of God eternal purpose and plan of God that was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God could now be made known to principalities and powers in heavenly places. This he said was according to God's will. God was doing that then and setting the stage and it could have begun with these people. And though they were, they died before Jesus was born, they still could have been saved when Jesus died for eternal life by having lived within their commitment to God, and they would have enjoyed the grace that he spoke of here when he said, I threw off your bonds. I broke your yokes. I made it possible for you to have forgiveness of sins. Oh yes. And then the real thing happened, of course, for those of us who are on this side of the cross. And when Jesus died, the blood flowed forward to cover our sins. Years ago, God also broke our yokes and threw off our restraints. And he gave us the freedom to choose, to choose righteousness, to choose obedience, to choose faithfulness, to choose him as opposed to the world or in alignment with anything or anyone other than himself. He doesn't want us to be gadding about with false religion any more than he wanted the children of Israel to do so. He will not be forgiving of those who will not themselves repent and turn to him who chase and follow all kinds of things that are man-made and those religions too are just kind of like a stick. They promise great things, but they can't do anything because Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven of that kind of thing that ultimately he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. You never were a part of what God had in mind because you were doing your own thing. What, what would be the application? 
that we ought to make if we're wanting to avoid making the same kinds of mistakes that God's people in that age was making, where, where would we come down on this? And how would this, the principle of this passage from the Old Testament apply to us? Wouldn't it call for us to review our commitment, our relationship to God, our marriage? We're, we're the bride of Jesus, the church is Jesus' bride. And when we became Christians, we became part of that church and we became so affiliated with Jesus Christ that in fact, we were saying, Lord, I will always be faithful to you. And we acknowledge that the scriptures themselves say that for us to be perfect uh, is not possible. We'll make some bad mistakes and some bad choices. But still, there's the grace of God through the blood of Jesus that will forgive us as Christians when we repent. And we're not bound so that we can't be forgiven. And John said, my little children, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. That eternal life is not promised to the gadabout who goes chasing all kinds of things. The one who says it doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The one who says it doesn't make any difference what church you're a member of. It doesn't matter what they teach. It doesn't matter how they worship. It's just so that, that you've got that, that, that connection and faith. But there's more to it than that. And so I think it starts with us saying, I am the bride of Christ. And I can't go gadding about flirting with all kinds of religion whenever he died and is the head of the church that God had in mind all along. It starts with us understanding who we are and what a relationship is. It moves on to a commitment that means I put him first in everything. That's what Jesus was talking about, wasn't it? In Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Put him first in everything. Put him first. Don't go guiding about. You don't have to make a decision about who's first. Jesus is. God is. You don't have to make a decision about where your commitment is. If you became a Christian, you became committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are married. Don't go gadding about, flaunting and flirting with things other than what the Word of God teaches. But put that kingdom and His Word first and fulfill what He called us to do in sharing it with others. The reproduction that we're supposed to be involved in is spiritual. And we're supposed to be going into all the world, preaching gospel to every creature, going to every nation, and teaching it to every individual and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with the promise that Jesus will be with us. But we're supposed to also continue to teach them, disciple them, lead and point them in the right direction as an ongoing process. We never get enough people saved we never get to retirement when it comes to doing the will and the purpose of God, but to get ourselves so committed that we, just like in a marriage ceremony, say, until death do us part. We are children of God to serve Him and do His will for as long as we're on the surface of this earth, as long as we're in the kingdom, part of the kingdom, we commit ourselves to faithfulness as long as we live. We live in a, a time when we're reminded of what God was talking about when he said, your, your fathers didn't say, where's God? And the prophets and the priests didn't say, where's God? Nobody sought the will of God first. We live in an environment, in a culture where people aren't concerned much, if at all, about what God wants. 
We wouldn't be having all of the issues that we often are debating in the political scene about not being able to teach the Word of God or teach children the Bible in, in school or teach morality in school or, or ceasing to, to, to take the lives of the innocent before they can be born. We wouldn't be having all of that of people were saying, where is God? What does he want? What did he say? What's his instruction? We wouldn't have that. But we live in a world where people aren't saying, where's God? But we have to be the ones. We have to be the ones who say, what is the will of God? What has God said on this? What does he teach? And then sharing it in every way we can to everyone who will listen. That's what a faithful bride would do. Would uphold and would sacrifice to make sure the will of the groom is carried out. That's why we emphasize evangelism. That's why we're beginning to roll out this plan that will involve the, the business of discipling, of finding and winning people and helping them to go to heaven. That's why we're pushing out on the idea of let's study the Bible more, let's learn it, let's learn it in our homes, let's study it in our homes, let's teach our neighbors and our friends, and let's pray and pray and pray and pray, saying, where is God? Where is God? What is the will of God? Lord, teach us. Yes, until we're fixated on the idea of service and being the proper bride, we may be tempted to gad about, to flirt with the world. When God has said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Lord will abide forever. When we became Christians, we became committed. And if we have forgotten that, then we're in danger of contributing to the culture that fails to focus on God. That's, that's our application, isn't it? That's the transition into this age and, and what we are and what we're to do. Practice righteousness. Live as much like Jesus as we possibly can. Be holy. Be distinct. Be different. People, Satan's I don't know what his favorite tool is, but I know that one of the things that he likes most to use is intimidation. And he likes to intimidate us by saying, if you teach those things, then you're just going to be out of step with everybody else. If you dress that way, if you uh, behave that way, if you live that way, if you look at things that way, you're just not going to be on the popular vein. You're going to be out of step. And yes, 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 we will have to be out of step. Come out from among them and be you separate, the Lord said. And Isaiah and the Apostle Paul quoted it in writing to the church at Corinth. And he said, when you do, I'll be with you. I'll be your father, and I'll help you, and I'll guide you, and I'll save you. That's what it calls for. But as long as we think we can just drift through here and kind of more or less be a Christian and, and attend some of the services and open the Bible now and then and give a little and, and compromise maybe a lot, the end thereof for the ways of death. And God said, you're going to suffer. He said, the people you are aligning yourself with are going to be your destruction. He said, Egypt is going to destroy you and Assyria is going to destroy you. They were so positioned geographically that Assyria, one great power, with horses and chariots and strong war tools, I'll call it, was north of them. And Egypt, that was the other side of the coin that was known for horses, is south of them. 
And they just kept gadding about and whatever the political sway was, if it looked like that Egypt was more powerful right now, they tout out to, to Egypt. And if it looked like Assyria was, they tout out to them. And God said, the very people you're going to, to try to get your protection are going to be the ones who are going to take you out. There's only one place to turn for security. And that's to go back to our protector, to the one who also said, Hi, he made a commitment to us too. Be thou faithful unto death and I'll give thee the crown of life. You see, it's not just that we took vows to God. God made vows to us too. But he wants faithful people. None of this gadding about half-hearted lack of commitment, but people who will do the real thing in the right way. And we are called to be the ones. And if we don't do it, can you look around the world and tell me who's going to? If we don't live up to what God called us to do, is there any hope for this world? You can say, well, Jesus. Jesus is the hope of the world. Yes, yes. But if they don't hear, how shall they believe? And without faith, it's impossible to believe. Put that, you know, connect the dots. There is no time, there's no place for gadding about, but for consistent, faithful Christianity that's real to be the way we live. If tonight you're subject to an invitation of Jesus, anyway, if you should be here and ready to become a Christian, that then praise God for that. And we'd love to help you to become a child of God through baptism as you repent of your sins and faith tonight. And if you're one who's in the kingdom and you realize I've been playing Christianity and I've been flirting with the world and with sin and I've been flirting with this and that, I've been gadding about. You need to straighten that up. I love you. I want you to go to heaven and, you know, you do, but we can't play games. We're serious and it's time to settle. It's time to have direction. It's time to have a goal. It's time to pursue what we focus on, and that is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. If you're subject, come while we stand and sing.